Okay, we can start. Uh, room is really full. Very happy to welcome you to this presentation. All three speakers uh, are uh, from, uh, from the same company, Nuvole, and uh, you see them listed uh, here in, in the order in which we will be speaking, Andrea, then Fabian, then Antonio. We will be talking about configuration management, uh, theory and practice, actually more practice than, than theory. Uh, we, <coughs> we all work for Nuvole, which is a 100% Drupal company. We only do Drupal projects. Uh, and we have a distributed team uh, in uh, Italy, Belgium, and Czech Republic. The three of us are the core team, and each of us lives uh, in a, a different country. So you can imagine the kind of uh, problems we had with previous versions of Drupal for those who work with them. And um, our projects and uh, our clients uh, need uh, a very good configuration management uh, because we work with uh, international organizations, institutions, uh, and uh, we always need uh, fast delivery. We have several developers that are working simultaneously on the same project. So our workflow must accommodate for uh, working together in a safe way. And we have very frequent configuration changes. They ask us to, to make a change, to deploy it very quickly, and we need to be sure that updates will be safe. So let's see a list of uh, issues and how much they are covered by the current uh, uh, configuration management in core or uh, other modules. First one is, of course, the basic need. Can I deploy configuration? Meaning that uh, can I develop my configuration on my uh, local development machine and keep the production site online all, all the time? And can I export configuration changes from development and import them into production? As everybody here probably knows, the answer is yes, with Drupal 8 uh, you can. With previous version of Drupal it was a bit hackier, but with Drupal 8 this use case is completely covered. And uh, so it is a new solution to a very ancient problem that we had in Drupal 6 uh, or 7. And the reference use case, do not forget these two lines, is exporting the configuration changes from development and importing them into production of the same site. There, uh, we will uh, have to extend it uh, in multiple ways, but uh, configuration management is a tool that was meant for a specific purpose it is perfect for this specific purpose, and, uh, but this specific purpose is not the, the real life. So let, let's see this specific purpose, our reference use case for configuration management. First, our issue is that we will uh, clone the site to the development environment. Okay, you can start from either of the two. You install the site somewhere, be it production or development. Uh, in, in the reference use case, it would be production. In our real life experience, it's probably development, the one where we actually install it first. And the idea is I install one, I make a full backup with database and files and everything, I clone the production site by restoring the backup. This is already something that uh, will have to be improved, uh, but uh, the reference use case says this. Step two, we just modify configuration. A production site just goes on and we need to, to develop on it. We make configuration changes and uh, step three, the live site is still live, of course. And when we are done with development, we export all our configuration changes. We are uh, told uh, what, uh, what is changed, we commit and we push. Step four, we go online and we pull configuration. So we now have a staged configuration that uh, uh, is exactly what we, we develop. And step five is review of changes before applying them to production. So we have drush commands now that uh, allow to diff uh, our, uh, our changes, we inspect uh, we check that everything is, is expected, and uh, last step, we apply the changes to production, and it is as easy as uh, typing Y for yes. And uh, this is beautifully covered uh, with uh, Drupal 8. We, we love configuration management for uh, this use case. Uh, only one small uh, note here, uh, the, the full workflow on uh, 
on the production side would uh, look like something like this, actually. I mean, not only configuration, but uh, also running uh, all the database updates first. Uh, actually, this is enforced by an issue that will be committed to core. But still, uh, as long as configuration is concerned, that, uh, that is all you need to do. Problem solved, yes, for what uh, we wanted to solve. But uh, as I said, the real life uh, is really much more complex than this. We want to do more. It's uh, a very nice start, but uh, uh, we want to do more. We want to do stuff uh, in a really clean way. So for example, where are we supposed to get rid of database dumps to move configuration to start? And uh, we are now seeing uh, a lot of other scenarios and how they can or cannot be solved by configuration management and by what we have now uh, in core. So the first one is how can I install a site from existing configuration? Meaning uh, I hate uh, the step uh, we had to do that uh, we needed a full database dump. Just because uh, a database dump is inherently dirty, not uh, even if it is the cleanest uh, database dump possible, it's uh, a moment where you lose control, where uh, for, for the first time in your development, you would have something that uh, is not based on text file, is not something that you can inspect. We want everything to always be um, tracked by text file and uh, uh, something uh, <coughs> versioned uh, and, um, and something that we can really know what is, uh, is going on. So a database dump means we lose control and how do we solve it? Uh, we throw the database dumps away and uh, we use configuration installer. So this is our first tool. Uh, usually running the installer creates a new site. I mean, configuration management has a concept of uh, unique IDs uh, and uh, it wouldn't work properly if uh, we, we try to start clean on the production side too. But configuration installer is uh, designed to solve this exact problem. It is an installation profile. Installation profile is uh, one of the first screens in the Drupal installation. You select either minimal or standard or anything else. And in this case, you would select config installer. And it takes over the Drupal installer and it allows sites to be creating the from an existing configuration. So typically, we will see how it changes in, in practice, but you will have a configuration you want to clone, you just clone configuration. You do not uh, replicate the database because the database has things that are not under control. It is an installation profile, you place it uh, in the profiles folder. And uh, yeah, it is such a, a good tool that it should be on every site uh, and uh, possibly in core but uh, we are going to say more about this. If uh, you are not familiar with the user interface of configuration installer, this is simply where it plugs in. And once you have selected configuration installer as uh, your profile, you get a new screen here to import uh, uh, existing configuration. So the typical workflow will look like uh, I'm uh, the developer, I exported uh, I, uh, my configuration, it's in Git, and the production site is not cloned database-wise, but uh, by importing uh, the full configuration I exported from my development machine. What about having it in core? Uh, there's an issue for, uh, for that, uh, and uh, there is a sprint about this, so we might see it uh, done or uh, consider it doable uh, by this DrupalCon already. So, um, we might finally have uh, uh, Drupal sites, Drupal core sites that uh, can uh, start from an existing configuration and solve uh, this first issue we identified. Next step and next problem. Uh, for uh, questions, uh, we are grouping all questions to after the, the session, so just be, please be patient and uh, when, when we are done, we will have uh, some minutes for uh, all questions. Can I override the local configuration? Meaning I am a developer, okay, I have this wonderful tool, uh, but uh, it starts to, to feel like a problem having a tool that really exports the whole configuration. And uh, this means that uh, if I want to customize my development configuration in ways that I do not want to get exported in production, for example, uh, 
I have different API keys in my uh, local machine and in production. Or uh, I want verbose error logging enabled in my local machine, but turned off in production. Uh, if I do things the, the normal way by saving forms, then I'm effectively altering configuration. And these small changes would be exported and picked up on production. So uh, this is something that I do not want. Fortunately, we are uh, covered for this use case by the concept of overriding. Overriding uh, is just meant to give us the way to apply these uh, local changes on our development environment, even though it is not covered by the reference use case, it is covered by the standard uh, Drupal core, core tool that is the config array. In, uh, and uh, here is how it works. With the config array, you have uh, runtime overriding in code. Configuration is still there, but it gets overridden. So what you see is not what is in configuration. Um, the typical example is to add a line to settings.php or uh, like the documentation advocates for uh, settings.local.php file that you include from settings.php in your development environment. And uh, here you just define values for uh, this array that will override whatever the configuration says. So for example, to enable verbose error logging in development only, you write this uh, line of code. How does it work for uh, editing? Uh, for editing, Drupal is uh, very smart. If you open a form that would modify overridden configuration, you do not see your overridden value because Drupal prevents you from saving it by mistake. Drupal knows that uh, this configuration uh, value was not set in configuration, but was overridden by you in code in the settings.php file. And it will show to you the old version, the original non-overridden setting. This means that uh, whatever stupid things I do with uh, config is really local to my environment. Uh, if I edit uh, a form and save it, overridden values will not be there. It's, uh, it's very smart if you think about it. And same, of course, will happen for exporting. When you export, uh, these overrides are not uh, exported. So this is exactly what we want from, uh, from this tool. Local configuration that stays local overrides uh, the full configuration locally. Uh, if you're curious uh, on how Drupal uh, managed to, to do this, uh, well, if you delve into code, uh, you will find that uh, whenever configuration is retrieved, it can be retrieved as mutable or immutable, uh, as Drupal calls it. When uh, we are uh, <coughs> retrieving for a uh, read-only mode, like uh, the real configuration you have, or uh, um, the display of uh, configuration, it's immutable if it is read-only. So overrides are considered because uh, it would be harmless to, to display them. This is why you can override with config and have uh, the displayed site name in the header being the overridden value. Since you are reading it uh, and when reading, it is safe to include overrides. In the other uh, scenario, when you want to set or export values, overrides must be ignored. And Drupal uh, has special uh, um, ways to, to get configuration in this case, and it is the mutable configuration, and it, uh, it is used when configuration is retrieved in read-write mode, something that I will want to retrieve, then modify and save. And this is the trick that Drupal uses to be clean with overrides. Uh, there is only one small issue left, but uh, fortunately this is quite easy to address. Uh, how do I actually find the, the keys and values to put in config? Well, you do it uh, in the form first. You export configuration and you inspect uh, the diff. So the first time you, you really make the changes locally, then you will throw them away. Uh, you see what uh, configuration file changed you see what properties changed by, by really looking at the YAML file. And from here, you get system.logging and system.logging will be the first key here. 
error level, and the error level will be the second key here, and the value verbose will be verbose here. Then you trash you cor the, the real configuration change, and uh, you only keep uh, your code copy. Is this satisfactory? Yes, but again, you can only alter existing configuration, meaning that uh, you cannot add new configuration this way. You cannot completely unset existing configuration either. And uh, there are things that still you cannot do this way. Like you cannot override which modules are installed. Typical use case, I want the devel module in my local machine, not in production. I will not be covered uh, here. And uh, there are uh, also a few quirks uh, that uh, you cannot really override some small things like uh, the color of Bartik and other things that are coded in uh, non-standard way, so to say, so it's, uh, they cannot uh, be overridden this way for technical reasons. But uh, if we need more, we have more tools and I let Fabian talk about the other use cases. Yes, so the, I don't know, is the microphone? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. All right, um, so the, the next uh, step is to uh, exclude modules from getting into the production deployment um, workflow. And often we have this case that we want to have development modules uh, on our site and then not uh, export them. Uh, there are several options. The, the first one is uh, with Drush. Drush has um, a flag uh, that you can set called uh, skip modules. And you can give it a list of modules that you want to ignore. Um, but at the moment, uh, Drush still exports the configuration that depends on these modules. So when you do that, you also have to git ignore the configuration that the comes with those modules. Um, otherwise, the configuration that you export results in an in a invalid state because you have configuration that depends on modules that are not installed and the Drupal will, will not uh, import the configuration again. So you, you have to inspect it manually uh, to, to make sure that uh, your, your export is still in a consistent state. Um, there's a, a second uh, method that uh, previous Next recently uh, blocked about. Um, they add uh, the concept of a ignore list, um, which is a, a YAML file where you uh, list all the configuration that you would like uh, Drush to ignore when uh, exporting. It works in a similar way as the, um, the native Drush command. Um, and the third method is a, a new module uh, called configuration split. Um, and their configuration overrides are not at runtime but at import export time. So the configuration that you have active in, in, on your local site uh, is, is the one that you, you want to have. So you, on your local site, you have uh, the development modules enabled and you have the configuration for, the, for those modules. But when you export it, you split them off. And um, the, the split is a configuration in itself. So um, a part of this configuration is which folder the split will be exported to. Um, you can have a blacklist of configuration in addition to, to the ones that are detected from the modules that uh, you want to split off. Uh, for example, um, in Devel, you also want to remove the Devel uh, menu item, which does not explicitly depend on the Devel module. And you can uh, have a set of configuration that is ignored um, when importing and exporting. So it's, it's when the blacklist configuration, when you export it, it gets removed from the sync directory for, where the normal export would go to. And the ignored one will leave the one that is already in the folder and export the, the setting uh, to, to the folder. And of course, the configuration, they're, they're entities themselves, so they're configuration themselves, so you can override them with the config uh, override uh, method. There, there's a Drush commands for, for that, that es essentially um, replace the, the config export and config import Drush command, and also there's a, a Drupal console command to, to do the same. Um, 
So this is uh, the current UI that for, for this uh, split uh, configuration. Um, it's much nicer with the <laughs> also chosen. Um, and at the bottom there would be also the uh, weight, so you can have several splits and uh, weight them so that they, they happen in the correct order. Um, the, the next big uh, chapter is uh, how to work in parallel with a colleague. Um, we, we've seen this uh, configuration export and configuration import, but how does it work if two people work at the same time? Um, the problem is that when you export configuration, um, you remove all the configuration that is in the export directory, and when you import the configuration, you remove everything that is in your local uh, active uh, configuration storage. Um, but uh, luckily there is a Git, so if you work with Git and you let Git uh, handle the merging, then you're mostly on the safe side. So in uh, this case, we, we, we consider two instances of the same site. Um, multiple, we, we don't cover it right here, but it's essentially the same. It's, it works for, for as many copies as you want, and uh, Git just merges, uh, and you have to gen then just import the configuration again. Um, text files are, are perfect for Git, so, uh, I mean, it was also designed with, with Git as, uh, in mind. So, um, the, the way uh, this works is you share a Git repository for both uh, code and configuration. Um, you install the site from the initial configuration, as Andrea uh, explained before, and you adopt the successful Git branching model. Um, the project Bootstrap uh, is very similar. The first developer that starts the project installs it with, with the installer and exports the configuration and commits it to Git. Uh, every other subsequent developer and the production just clone the code and install it with the configuration installer profile. And then go from there. Um, so the parallel development, we, we work with the Git branches and uh, commit and push the configuration changes to the branch. The, in, in parallel, but um, careless merging uh, can be dangerous and, and maybe problematic. Uh, remember that Git does not care about Drupal at all. Git is completely independent from Drupal. But the configuration is very important to Drupal. So you need uh, to let Git do the merging and let Drupal decide whether the merge was <coughs> successful or not. Um, if you do not follow the a, a good workflow, then um, you may lose uncommitted work. Uh, you may accidentally overwrite uh, work of other developers. And um, configuration could look okay at first, but actually is not uh, valid for Drupal. So the safe sequence is uh, exporting configuration, committing it, merging uh, other people's configurations, importing the configuration and uh, pushing to, to the other developers. Um, let, let's uh, look at a couple of cases, what happens when, when you don't respect this order. For example, if you import it before you export it, then um, you delete all your work, all the, all the things you, you did uh, since the previous time, and there's no backup, so <laughs> tough luck. Um, when you merge before exporting, the export deletes the previous work and replaces it with by what you have in your uh, site. So um, you, you, you basically ignore what uh, your colleagues have done. Um, and you, you can recover this because uh, Git can handle that. It's, it's just not a straightforward workflow, but with uh, some Git foo, you can, you can recover from this. Um, if you merge before commit, then um, you will have the unstaged files uh, and you merge and then maybe 
uh, you get in trouble when, when there's a merge conflict. Um, and it's not as easy as just reverting to the uh, commit that you knew worked, uh, because merge conflicts obviously cannot be imported um, as, as such. And if you forget to import it after uh, you merged, then you will keep the state of, of your Drupal site the way you had it before uh, you, you did the merge, and you continue developing, and then the next time you export it, you're in the same situation as before, and you uh, may um, have more difficulties then to solve what should be merged and, and how, how it should uh, work. Um, if, we, if we look at a, a nice example, um, how you can break the configuration with Git, uh, you're all familiar with the standard installation profile, I guess, so you install that. The first developer on his branch uh, deletes the tags uh, from the article content type. Um, that results in uh, two changes, and two files are removed, the field instance and the field storage, because the tags was uh, only used on the article content type, and when you remove the last field, it also removes the storage. The developer B adds a tax, the, the tax field reuses the field uh, for the basic page, which results in adding the field instance for, for the basic page. So th this work happened in completely different files, so Git is very happy to merge this. But the resulting merged configuration is invalid because now you have the field instance for, for the tags on the basic page without the field storage. And um, it will just not work. So the takeaway from this is that um, when merging the configuration, always check that it's still valid by, by importing it. And, and, and at this point, you can also then fix it uh, relatively easily. Of course, this, this is example is, is uh, um, very basic and, and uh, it, of course, you, you don't do it exactly this way, but when, when you're working on a larger project, uh, things that are more complicated than this, but have the same effects, can, can also happen. So. Okay, so now we are going to have a look at another use case. So um, what about package configuration and reuse it? I mean, this was actually what we were all used uh, to in Drupal 7, right? So in Drupal 7, we had like features that was covering both use cases. So it would cover, uh, uh, the deployment use case, because it would package your configuration features and deploy it, and then uh, have it on production. But then it would also uh, cover the reusage use case. So in Drupal 8, configuration management works a little bit differently as we have seen so far. Basically, the uh, configuration in Drupal 8 is monolithic, so you have one configuration that covers the whole site. You don't have uh, necessarily configuration packaged into module. Uh, so what features is uh, uh, for Drupal 8 does is uh, um, basically a configuration packager. So it's really uh, stop acting as a, as a deployer, let's say, if you want, and uh, it became only uh, what it was best at it, so a packager of configuration. This is entirely new for Drupal 8, and it takes advantage of configuration management, of course, because in Drupal 8, modules can have configuration already. So they can, you can, if you are a module has configuration in the install directory, you can install configuration once the module is enabled. And basically what feature does, it reuses uh, this, this, uh, this technology that is already there. Um, what feature offer then, since uh, the configuration uh, it's all taken care of by core, it offers an automatic packaging, and this is really what uh, feature is best of. So what feature does, feature basically analyzes uh, your site and automatically detects way of slicing your site into features. And uh, so um, then it can propose to you basically the different ways that you can featureize your, your current site and package configuration and reuse maybe one module of your site on another, on another, uh, on another site. Um, so basically, fe uh, features for Drupal 8 only focus on, on, on reusage. And it is a, a development module. It means that the features in Drupal 8 do not depend from the features module anymore like it was with Drupal 7, right? So it is really like develop. It should actually uh, never even commit your f the features module itself to, to production. It's just a development module like develop is, okay? So it's just packaging, it's, uh, and, and that's it, and it's job is done. Um, the resulting features, as we said already, are, are just modules. Uh, so they, they just uh, 
come with configuration, you enable the, the module, so the feature, and uh, Drupal Core will take care of taking configuration from the install directory contained into the module and uh, staging it to your site. From that moment on, you will uh, treat that configuration as part of your monolithic Drupal 8 core configuration. So in, um, when you develop over this site, you will just export all the configuration as, uh, as we have seen so far and just continue with the normal workflow. So it's just about features are really usable for reusage and uh, to bootstrap basically the, the project. Um, so yeah, uh, how, how feature works, so uh, let's see a, a quick example on how to use feature. So you enable the feature module, then you also enable the feature UI module, and then you visit the uh, setting page uh, where you basically have, uh, depending on the um, like slicer that you, that you enable, you can have different uh, features proposed to you. For example, uh, you can have features proposed to you by content type, so everything that belongs to a related to a content type is packaged into features and proposed to you like a blog feature, for example. Or you can have like namespacing slices, so you can say, uh, slice my site per namespace, everything, uh, all configuration that uh, is prefixed with this namespace should belong to a feature. So by configuring this, uh, um, uh, this settings, basically, features can propose to you um, already packaged module, let's say. Then what you do is just uh, check that box and then download it and then you have your configuration basically ready to be uh, reused on, uh, on another uh, site. So the takeaway message of features for Drupal 8, it's really the following. I mean, um, if you are using uh, features uh, for deployment, you're doing, really doing it wrong. It's not its main use case. You could do that, but it's a bit of a headache. I mean, configuration management really, really works well for that. So there is no reason to find other, other solutions for that. Uh, it's to reuse partial configuration across sites, so you're not going to store all your site into a feature and then use it in another site and making the other site, right? It's just a way to package bits of configuration for your site, for example, the blog feature, etc. And then it's only a development module this time, so all your modules that you create with features do not depend from features, so you don't need to have it around on production, which is very, very good news. Uh, so, is, it, is feature perfect? Because it looks perfect so far, but there are actually some shades, because um, the way configuration management is, it does not really allow full packaging, at least not for every kind of configuration. Uh, for example, well, the first thing, overrides are not supported properly, so updating a custom distribution, for example, if you have a distribution that uses features, and you, you stage, like, you enable a feature, like a blog feature, from that moment on, that configuration into the blog feature is part of your uh, configuration workflow normally. Uh, what happens if there is a new version of that, uh, of the blog feature itself that has different configuration? So the feature does not uh, provide you with a clean path to do that. So the updates, uh, the, the, the blog feature will need to provide custom update hooks to, in order to tweak that the configuration changes, etc. Uh, well, menu links are not exportable, but that's by design because menu links are content entities in Drupal 8. There are modules to go around that, uh, but uh, yeah, that's also what feature does not provide uh, as, a, as opposed to uh, the version of Drupal 7. And then last but not least, permissions are not exportable. So, and they are currently removed. Why? Because at the moment, permissions in Drupal 8 are part of information attached to the role configuration object, basically. So you cannot uh, abstract a permission from a role that is attached to. And that's, again, Drupal 8 by design, so we don't have any way of going around that. So uh, let's say a feature is perfect as far as it can go. Uh, and for these three um, uh, like, um, gaps, let's say there is actually a documentation page. Uh, actually, uh, I must say the features uh, for Drupal 8 documentation is really, really well written. You find all the answers to, to your questions there. And uh, you can have a look to the gaps. There are uh, links to issues about those three issues there and uh, possibly also feature issues, so if you are interested, you can, you can have a look uh, at that. Okay, so now it's, uh, here's another problem. So everything is, uh, looks pretty, pretty nice now. Our life is much, much easier as developers. We have answers for most of our problems that we had in Drupal 7, so it's really an ideal situation so far, but we still have this. This did not go away in Drupal 8. So what happens if a client starts to mess up with configuration on production, right? This is actually different because imagine um, the ideal situation. So you have like conf all your configuration is correctly exported 
uh, its version is deployed. And uh, your development team is great, works great together, and adopts a solid Git branching model. So it takes care of, of, of um, having uh, a branch per feature and storing the configuration and everything. But when, once the configuration is deployed on production, then the client starts to fiddle with your configuration and changes stuff. So what happened then? So uh, the problem here is that changing configuration is an act of development in Drupal 8 anywhere because since configuration is monolithic, any submit form submitted you do on the administration page is a change in configuration, meaning that that's a total effect development. So if your client is actually your, a development that you cannot, a developer that you cannot control, that you will nev never be able to control. So you need to find a way around that. There are different uh, options. This is the most radical one, the one I love the most, because it really solves the problem. I mean, it's a, an actual solution to the problem, which means you can just lock the configuration and production, and there is no way even with user one that you can actually submit a form ever again. Of course, this is not a configuration. It's not exportable, okay? It's just um, a setting that you add to uh, your setting PHP on the production environment. So it's an environment-specific uh, setting. And this basically locks the configuration of production. It's very nice. I mean, un un until the clients complain, of course. <laughs> the second one, uh, it's a bit more elaborate, but this will allow the client to do more or less whatever he wants. So, but then you need to have a person that is responsible for following that, following what, what, what's happening. So uh, the, the, if we can say the bad side of having a monolithic configuration is that anything, everything is struct, this is also the strength of configuration management because since everything is struct, then everything is traceable. So, Whatever the client does, you can uh, be sure that you know about it. Why, how? By exporting the configuration from production and then diffing it with the one you have in development, right? Because then you know what changed. Yeah. Before in Drupal 7, for example, you didn't know what changed. That was also bad because uh, that happened also in Drupal 7. So what you would do, you would have like a different branch if you, say, if you, if you, if you want. Um, you would have like um, dump the configuration from production on this very branch and then work the Git, uh, work your way out with Git. So you could like compare these three different branches and then uh, decide what to do with that, call the client, etc. Once everything is set up, you just, uh, you just um, commit, merge the two, run again as continuous integration, maybe fix some tests if something important changed, etc. And once it's done, then you, you, you basically uh, restore the production uh, site to a, to a sanity level again, and, and then that's it. The third option is again configuration split. I mean, that's actually a module that Fabian is working on. Um, it's, uh, so the way that configuration splits works is that you can actually uh, configure which, conf which configuration entity goes where, in which directory, right? So you have like now one sync directory where all our configuration is, but if you use configuration split, you can say, I want this, this, and that configuration entity to go to another directory when I export. So you can really split them. This is pretty powerful because you can work your way around that uh, problem with the, with the client in many different ways. For example, you would want, imagine that that uh, client changed your uh, configuration online, okay, then you go and review the changes, say, okay, I want this configuration entity that my client worked on, for example, these three views, I don't want them to be part of my development thing because they will break my test and I don't care and this is not really what the site is about. But I still want the client to have it, right? Because it's work, let's say. So what you do, you take these configuration entities, you create configuration split entities, like saying that this tree goes to this directory aside. Like we call it, for example, config client. So that configuration stays there. It doesn't. It, it will never bleed into the sync directory. That is what the developers share. That is what the continuous integration uses to run tests, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? What you do then? Uh, you export, so you export using config split export command to that directory. This will read the configuration you have in your site and, and will do the right thing. You pull the new configuration of business as user, so you just git pull and the, the sync directory gets a new configuration, etc. And then you import configuration on production, but using the config split import, which will merge the two directory and then have it then, then on production. This will allow uh, for uh, the team to always have the same configuration under control and then have like, for example, extra views, extra content type that you really don't want to have around as a developer just on this directory there in the config client, for example, without bothering you. So, all right, so um, the last 
problem that we are going to, to face today. So can I deploy content uh, that my configuration depends on? So this is a very, very old problem. Imagine like a view that is filtered by taxonomy term. How many times we had that, right? So you export the viewing feature, but then there is like TID5. And then when you, when you, when you put that, uh, that view on, on production, TID5 is another term, right? It's not our TID5, so it's a mess. So, um, well, that's basically the problem. Uh, so the plan configuration depends uh, on nodes, blocks, uh, taxonomy terms, uh, whatever else. Um, the problem is that, uh, yeah, the content is not really exported along with configuration. Uh, but Drupal 8 got much, much better in that too, because first of all, content has UUID everywhere. So all content entities come with UUID, so they are actually unique. I mean, node will always have an ID, in, like one, two, three, but the actual ID is the UUID of that node. And that goes for all content entities, okay? It's really common. Then the first thing that uh, Drupal does, this is does by, by default. So when you import configuration, you will check for content dependencies on configuration, and then if the, those, con those content uh, en entities are missing, it will fire and import missing content event. This does under the hood, actually, okay? You can always uh, write an event subscriber and handle that event and do whatever you need to do. For example, if then you get the entity with this UID, then you might have that entity exported somewhere, and then you, you, you might just put that entity back and then fix the thing, you see? If nothing happened, then uh, there is uh, the final missing content subscriber is the only uh, content uh, event subscriber that actually handles that event is provided by Drupal Core, and what that handler does is simply removes at runtime those dependencies, content dependencies from that configuration, and then so that the um, configuration can be import, imported. It does not alter the configuration. It does not uh, change the configuration. So it's not saved without the dependencies. The dependencies are, sti are still there. It's just a runtime uh, removal, all right? So this is uh, option one. Option two, uh, you can use a very nice model called default content. So basically, this uh, default content takes advantage of all the effort that went into the Drupal headless initiative. So now we can export entities using the uh, HAL plus JSON format, and they, they take, can take care, uh, Drupal Core takes care about resolving the, the entity references. So if you export a node, you get also the author of the node, the taxonomy terms that are linked to the node, and all the rest. So, so that's all out of the box. Um, so basically, how the default content works is that if you have um, a, a module with a slash content directory with an entity type, so that's that format there, and you store your JSON you exported the entity in JSON using uh, different ways. The, the, be, the, the most convenient is using the trash command that comes with the module, of course, but you could also not use that. You could also fabricate your own way of exporting entities if you want. Uh, then once that module is enabled, then you get these um, entities imported, right? Uh, the next step, there is also an issue for that, is to actually not be bound to the event that the module is enabled or is installed in order to have the entities f like imported. You can do that as well, it's very easy. You can extend the service that this module um, provides and make your own custom service that does the trick. So you can export to a custom directory, commit your content with your code and with your configuration all together, your default content, right? Not all your content, just the content that the configuration depends on. And then you can then uh, part of your, of, your, of your build, let's say, will be also to import the default content. Um, yeah, so then uh, this is actually a, a layout of what you get when you use a default content module. So that's, that's actually our, our default content dump that we have for one of our projects. It's not really the, the same directory structure because the default content module does not have the bundle names under the entity type, so that's what we did. It's very easy, you just extend the service, you, you add that, so you can, you can format this. And there you can see also how, how it looks. So it's just a JSON file, that's the UUID, your best friend in this case. Uh, yeah, language code title and all the fields plus the references, it's all, it's all bundled together. So that's option two. Option three, of course, is to use deploy, but that's, then you get really serious about that. I mean, if you really need a complete content deployment solution, then that's, that's the way to go in Drupal 8. It's an amazing module and it's very, very well done. Of course, you have to set up all your deployment uh, environment. So it's not as lightweight as the other, but you achieve basically everything is the real actual solution to the actual problem. 
Um, the last thing, I mean, you, you, you can also, like, Drupal 8 is also like next to the hook updates that we are all fa very familiar with as Drupal developer in Drupal 7. You also have another hook, which is meant uh, for you to work with content manipulation. And that hook is called post update. It is not a hook that uh, has a number after it, so it does, does not work like the hook update. It does not have like uh, 8001, 8002, because it's not meant to be run sequentially. This is a one off operation that you do to fix your content when you know what you're doing, when you're fixing, and you know the state of the site that you're fixing, right? It's really meant for this. So if your configuration blocks something, okay, you know that your production site has that state, you build, you, you do this, you implement this, your fix is in this hook. This is executed only once after the hook updates are run. Only that one time, and that's it. It's very useful when you have modules in unstable, uh, um, state that will change still the the, uh, the schema, for example. Uh, in Drupal 8, it's quite common now still. So, and then this will basically fix, um, uh, yeah, fix your content. All right. So that's the um, that's the basically uh, overview of what we what we've seen. You want to? I can go ahead. Okay. So that's basically the overview of like we we are giving stars. I mean, that's not uh, of course like. Uh, you know, saying one is worse, one is bad, but like it's a more like a completion, like the, to have an idea of what uh, what's the levels of completion of answer of all these problems that we that we have planned. So, can I deploy configuration? Yes, we can, for sure. Obama way. Can I install a site from existing configuration? Yes, but there's still some quicks, like like we have seen. Uh, it's still not in core, so it doesn't take five stars, like but but it's gonna be in core this weekend for sure. So it's it's gonna be there. Then it's still, uh, still a lot of work. So yeah, but we are <laughs> many, all right? of you help maybe. At the end yeah. of the week. <laughs> many people. So can I override local configuration? Yes, we can too. But still, there are there are some little issues there as well. So it's not hundred percent perfect like the deployment. Uh, can I exclude modules from getting deployed? Well, I I can, but then I have this problem with configuration that I need to exclude with git ignore. We have several solutions to do that. So it's still not really ideal. It's not established that much. So it gets four stars. Um, can I work in parallel with my colleagues? Absolutely, yes, in a ve very, very well uh, way. So can I patch configuration and use it? We can, really. That's not TripAdvisor 3. This is, 3 is good. Eh? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good, I mean, three stars are not one or zero, uh, three stars. But uh, I can patch configuration, yeah, we can package configuration and feature does very well, uh, very good job about that. But um, yeah, the core, that has some limitation and we have to go around that. And once we do it, we contribute, then we get five stars there too. Uh, well, can I handle a client messing with production configuration? That that would have taken two stars, but thanks to the read-only module, that took four because that's really actually a solution. So that's thanks to the read-only module. So yes, you can prevent this and maybe work your way around it. Yeah. Configuration speed is also a good uh, initiative uh, towards that. Um, and then uh, can I deploy my content? Again, four star. We can do that. Uh, the actual solution is pretty big, so uh, like deploy, and no, not everybody has the capability of you know, maintaining that. So it takes took four star because you still need a bit of ways around that. Uh, yeah, that's it. So I give you another word to Fabian for like a list. Of yeah, it, it's, it's it's just a, a list of projects. Uh, most of them we we touched in in this presentation. The config installer again, very useful. Um, to install uh, from an existing configuration, configure it only to not let uh, clients uh, mess with configuration on the live site. Uh, config update um, reports changes between the original and the active configuration of a module. Um, this is plays into the features use case a little bit. Features actually um, depends on this. Uh, config Devel is a module that helps with developing configuration. It uh, has a, a number of things it does. Uh, config Split, we, we covered in this uh, talk. Uh, config Tools um, allows you to automatically commit uh, configuration changes to, uh, to a Git repository. Um, and also, of course, automatically uh, exporting them uh, when you submit the form uh, before committing it. There, there's these two uh, features we, we covered. And uh, configuration sync, which is a way to synchronize back the configuration that comes, the original configuration that comes with the module, uh, in into the active store. So it, this solves a bit the problem that um, 
we had when, when you have a module and it comes with configuration, this configuration when you install the module gets into the um, site configuration and then is ignored from then on. So the um, uh, profiles and, and distributions update uh, will, will use something like that. Um, there is a couple more that, uh, and also newer ones that we, we didn't list, but uh, the, there, there's many people working in, in this space. So, um, thank you very much. Um, rate the session and the questions are in the microphone. They ask that everybody who's uh, making question please use the microphone there because uh, it, they are getting not recorded. Not your questions, like or, uh, a long yes. wait for. Um, is it possible to use uh, when you use config split to use different splits together? Yes. Um, and uh, only one of those splits. Uh, for instance, can you have a config split for your client config and a config split um, for your development config without importing them both? Yes. So uh, you can have different splits. Uh, they, they can be ordered so that they're um, split or they're applied in, in a certain order. And uh, from the Drush command, you can also select which split to include when importing the configuration. OK, cool. Thank you. So on, on the production, you would only import the, the, client. the, the client split, yes. OK, cool. Thank you. Uh, about uh, features, uh, if I understand it correctly, when you enable the feature, it imports the configuration. Should you just disable a feature after that because all the configuration is saved to the database and you can export it as a bulk? Um, or, or, it a depends, it yeah, it, it depends. Um, it depends from the module. It, yeah, it depends from the module right. because often, um, I mean, features is a module, so you can also provide uh, logic that comes with it. So, so often you don't only want to have it as a repository for, for yeah. the default configuration, but you also want it to do something with it. Yeah, and, and also, f since it's module, like the configuration will depend from the module, which is the feature. Not, not in the features, not. Ah, okay, so, okay, so <laughs> at the, for Drupal 8, features <laughs> is kind of just a packaging sil uh, solutions yes. for your module. Yes. So it helps you collect your configuration into yes. the module. Um, regarding your takeaway, when merging, check that the configuration is still valid by importing it. Um, that doesn't work always. Imagine two people working on two separate branches on um, form displays, for instance, and adding a new entity reference field, which almost looks the same, but has a different bundle on it and different name. Um, if you do a merge after importing the, or after merging branch A and then merging branch B, you will have um, um, a merge which will override the uh, first merge of branch A basically because it thinks that this is um, the same item it's working on, it has the same weight and um, also imports fine because it's not a broken configuration, it just works but um, you are actually missing features. So yes, exactly. And th that's why we, we recommend, that's why we say you always have to check it. You have to, you, you merge it and then you, you let Drupal decide whether, whether it's good or not. And of course, if Drupal is successful in importing it, you still have to make sure that it's actually correct. And, and for that, we, we recommend, of course, uh, automated tests and that, that check that the functionality will still work. Is it possible with config overrides to have uh, permissions override, like uh, I want my anonymous users to see the devil information? Uh, yes, a configuration can be overwritten. The per you, you override, in that case, the role, yeah. and you, you can override it as well, yes. In yes, that case, a new permission. <coughs> hmm? yeah, you override the role, and then you just uh, change the permission on that role. But you have to override the all I role. have to, okay, okay. The yeah, role you you override, the, uh, yes. The uh, file uh, is the role, uh, uh, the one we've seen in our example. So you would uh, have a first key the role, a second key the, the permission. Yes. Okay, thank you. Hi, I have a question related to writing integration test. Like, uh, how do you manage the configuration when uh, writing a Drupal web test case, like creating the fields and and all the 
-hmm. structures required to access the yeah, pages? Yeah, so, so for tests, we, we use uh, two different kind of tests. So the unit testing for the glasses and then BHAT actually for the site. So we perform behavioral tests. Okay. And for that, we, we rely on the fact that our, our um, sites will install cleanly. So there is a continuous integration environment that will install the sites and then we run the test on top. Uh, so we, we use that one. And that uh, does not, uh, we don't care basically about the database dump or the state of the database uh, because we, yeah, we, just, we just use BHAT basically. But the actual uh, YAML files with the fields and uh, the base fields, how do you? That's all included in the configuration which is packaged in the site as well. So we, we push the configuration together with all the site. The site installs using configuration installer, using that configuration. So we recreate basically a clean starting point, including also content. So we, if we need content, we also import default content like we have, we have seen. So basically after the first install, all the site is really in a clean state. And on that state that we can assume basically, we run uh, all our BHAT tests. And the, the, only, the only test that tests the site is a behavioral test with BHAT. We don't have any other methods for that. Okay. And then next to that, we have unit testing for the classes and the object of the services themselves. But that's another thing. That also runs on continuous integration, but it does not test the site behavior. It tests the site code, which is a different kind of domain. Okay, yeah. Thank you. No problem. I have a few questions. Uh, yeah. First of all, uh, configuration uh, installer profile. Uh, can you automate things so that uh, you can uh, import them on uh, the deployment on, uh, on Jenkins Jump and things like that? Yes. Yes, uh, you can run it uh, yeah. with uh, with Rush site install as a parameter. So no problem. You can automate it uh, as much as, as okay, you wish. Okay, great. The, 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 the important part is that you set the um, the, the config directory. In, in before you run the installer yeah. in, in the settings for PHP. Yeah, okay. But uh, uh, the second the one way. is uh, related to features. You said that uh, it's a development module and you shouldn't install it on production. But then if you have a module that is already installed and you modify the configuration, how do you import the changes into the production? Because you, with features, you have features revert. But if you don't have it on production anymore, then you cannot revert the configuration to the new changes. Yes. So you shall do. You when, when, when you share the, the features or when, when you enable the feature, you do that on the development side. And on the development side, you revert the feature. And, and the, the revert becomes part of the site configuration that you then deploy. Yes, but uh, for example, I had the use case when uh, a module uh, was implemented. You had the configuration that was deployed already to production. Uh, this was a feature. And you locally, you changed it. And then uh, you deploy the configuration to production, but then you cannot revert that configuration. Yeah. You should do what? Import configuration, import? Hook updates. Well, uh, yes, at that point, you are on hook update or on Drupal's native uh, configuration management. I mean, the idea is not to, to use it as a deployment tool any longer. This yeah. is the direction they have taken. So you actually cannot use uh, features to all the, the things. Config yes, the, the config sync and the config update the detect this, um, whether, whether you do that. So, so it, you have to be clear whether you're talking about the, where the place where you de develop the feature or the site where you use the feature. And the site where you use the feature, you can have features enabled on, on the development instance of that site. And on the production instance, you don't revert the feature because you deploy the configuration that you reverted on the development side. Okay, and uh, one last question. Uh, if you have a configuration on the production that uh, you want for the user to, uh, for the administrator to allow to change, for example, uh, Facebook URL that you want for him to set up, but uh, you, when you import the configuration, you don't want to be overridden by your import, you, and also you don't want it to be put in repository because it's something that you want to be omitted. So How do you treat this case? Yeah, so, so in that case, you would use the configuration split, and you split it to a directory that is outside of the Git uh, repository. OK. And uh, as a general question, uh, as it seems features is more of a combination now between configuration split what offers and configuration sync modules. So which is the case that are you, you are using? Not really. The, they, they try to solve different use cases. The configuration split is, is really uh, a Run, uh, import time override of configuration and, and features is packaging yeah. configuration for reusing on other projects. 
like it helps you packaging and it does it also providing automatic slices and stuff so it's really a different use case so it still makes sense to use features actually a lot okay thanks thank you okay okay we're running out of time but uh, okay thank you, thank you guys.